my name is Nicole Brown and I really like bugs. Most people know that about me by now, but if you didn't, now you do. And today I wanted to talk to you guys about Kansas bugs in particular because it really is amazing what you can find in your own backyard. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, all of these bugs again can be found in Kansas. Um, some of them may be a little bit more to the east, to the west of where you live, um, but a lot of them are also found outside of Kansas as well if you happen to not live in Kansas and you just stumbled across this um, presentation online. So I like to call this my Kansas bug kit list um, because it's bugs that I think are really, really cool. Um, some of them I found before, some of them I haven't, and they're literally, you know, bugs that I want to find, so they're like, you know, bug kit list bugs. Mm -hmm. um, so first off, you know, what is a bug exactly? And, um, you know, to really understand that, we gotta know what an insect is. So insects have six legs and three body segments, the head, thorax, and abdomen, um, and that they can have um, up to two pairs of wings, um, compound eyes, all that fun stuff. They can have different kinds of mouth parts depending on what they eat. Um, so we have a very specific definition of what insect is, but when we think of a bug, it's really all creepy crawly animals from centipedes to millipedes to roly polies and spiders. Um, so I will be talking about bugs today and not necessarily specifically insects, though a lot of them are insects. And this is by far my favorite. So this is the best beetle. Um, if you haven't seen my um, presentation on best beetles in the form of a podcast, um, definitely check that out. Um, the Great Plains News Center does have two different podcasts and our family friendly one is called That's My Favorite. And I do talk about best beetles. Um, that episode is called Best Beetle because they are the best beetle. And I'll fight anyone who thinks otherwise. Um, these little guys really love old logs, so they are decomposers, so helping keep the forest clean, um, and they are mostly found um, in eastern Kansas, where there's a few uh, more dead, rotting logs around. Um, here in Wichita, um, we are historically really part of the Plains ecosystem, so um, we don't see them too often, but they are around. And they live in huge family groups and make over a dozen different calls. And it's not just the parents making calls and communicating with the larva or the babies, it's also the babies making noises and communicating with the adults as well. And they can make all sorts of different noises that mean anything from I'm cold, I'm hot, I'm hungry. Um, and those parents are actively taking care of their young, which is pretty unusual in the insect world. So they are great parents and they're super, super cool bugs, but I won't get into them too much because on the podcast, I did talk about them for an hour and we have other bugs to cover. So let's keep going. Um, this is another one of my absolute favorites. They're really, really, really common. Um, so I really like talking about these guys because they because they are so common and easily found, but they also are really, really cool. Um, so the adult there is that green little guy, and these are their eggs. So these eggs are laid on a little silk strand um, on grasses or you know leaves and things like that. And the reason for those strands is to keep them up off of the surface of the leaf. Um, that way they're safe from other bugs that might be coming along looking for a snack. So really, really cool adaptation. There's not very many bugs um, that have this, these kinds of unique eggs. So if you see anything that looks kind of like this, it's probably lacewing eggs. And they're most common um, in the summer and late fall. We do have brown lacewings as well that come out uh, later in the fall. Um, but this is specifically a green lacewing and her eggs. And these are what the babies look like. So very, very, very unique. And you'll notice the one on the right on the screen um, has a little aphid in its jaws and it kind of looks uh, very plain, but the one on the left is another larva. So the larva actually camouflage themselves. They'll put, you know, dead aphids on their back or other prey that they're eating or like uh, fluff from cottonwoods or milkweeds or leaves and they, they camouflage themselves so that they don't get eaten because underneath all of that fluff and debris, it's just that little squishy body that's nice and yummy. And like I said, they eat aphids and they eat 
a lot of aphids, especially in their um, larval stage. They're actually called aphid lions. So they are a really good form of pest control. If you ever see these guys in your garden, you definitely want to leave them alone because they are helping you out. And the assassin bug is another pretty beneficial um, insect to have in the garden. They have very, very um, intimidating mouth parts and a very painful sting, um, but they are really just cool bugs. Again, pretty common. Um, we get, you know, pictures sent to us at the Nature Center of like, oh my gosh, what's this weird bug? It has a wheel on its back, and that's the adult. Um, the top picture there is the larva or the, the you know, juvenile stage, and um, you never want to handle these guys necessarily. They're not aggressive, um, but that bite is really, really, really painful, and it's better just to, just to watch them from afar, but they are really, really cool insects, and I love them and the ant lions. So um, these guys have been in you know, popular media, media all over the place. Um, and even in real life, they are very intense little creatures. Um, so the top picture is showing you just how small they are. So that's, you know, on someone's finger. They're very, very, very small. And that is actually a grain of sand beside the ant lion. And then the second picture is showing you just a close up of their um, mouth parts. So they have they have huge pincers that they use to catch ants. And they do that with a special funnel trap. Um, and I have a video here in just a second to kind of show one in action. And the bottom picture is the adult. So they have very, very unique life cycles where as a larva, they're sitting in the bottom of the funnel and trapping ants. And the adults are winged and can fly around in order to you know, find mates. So here's that video. This is from BBC, um, their documentary series called The Hunt. Um, and it is an amazing series. This is just a really quick, I think like 15 second clip, um, but definitely check the full thing out if you can. I think it used to be on Netflix or Amazon or something like that. So if you can definitely stream it and it's really worth it. This entire clip, it's about three minutes long and you can find it on YouTube on the BBC's page. So definitely check it out. because It's really, really cool. Let's look. Each of these strange cone shaped pits is a death trap. With a brutal predator at its center. Here lie ant lion larvae, tiny ambush predators with venom filled pincers. So you can see just how intense those pincers are, and they do have venom in order to um, incapacitate the ants when they fall down into the middle of those traps. So they are just wicked cool predators, and I love them. I have found these um, pretty much all over Kansas. You're going to want um, a nice sandy area. They really like um, shaded spots, so it's not too hot, um, and just really loose, sandy, gravelly soil that they can dig in really well. Sometimes you'll find them kind of like underneath your house. Like if you have a house that kind of overhangs a little bit over your yard, you'll find them underneath that little spot right there because that, that ground is really soft. Um, and this is one of my absolute favorites that nobody knows about. And this is a toad bug. Um, the top picture is just kind of showing you um, how they kind of blend into their environment. They can be brown, they can be green, and it's everywhere kind of in between. Um, and the bottom picture is just a little bit closer of a picture. And they're called a toad bug because, well, first of all, they're very cute, and that's a cute name. But they do actually move by hopping. They live near water like a toad does, um, and they hop when they move. And whenever you see one of these guys, they almost just look like a little pebble. And then when you scare them, they just hop forward. And they don't, they don't really, they hop pretty fast, but they don't go very far. So if you ever see one, you can kind of, um, after it gets spooked, just wait for it to stop, and um, you can get a pretty good look at them. Even though they are really, really tiny, um, I really, really like these guys. And I've, I have found these in Chisholm Creek Park, um, anywhere kind of along the river, especially if you can get down in the woodland areas. Just always make sure you do a tick check afterwards, um, because even though these guys won't hurt you, there's plenty of other insects and bugs that will, so just be careful. And the giant red-headed centipede is another really, really fun one to talk about. Um, we had one for a little while, but it passed away. They don't live very long. Um, but these guys are super, super cool. Oops, sorry. 
Um, they are venomous, so you don't want to handle them again. Um, and they can cause anywhere from like a slight skin irritation just from them walking on you um, to even skin necrosis or death. So if they like actually bite you, um, some people have a really, really bad reaction to their venom and it can kind of make make your skin rot away where they bit you. Um, if you get it treated, it's not life-threatening, but it's it's just kind of nasty. And if you ever see one of these guys, just leave it alone. Um, I have found these in Kansas, specifically while flipping rocks out in the Flint Hills, I have found them. So they are around and they're really, really cool and they can grow up to eight inches long. So they are really big um, snippies. <laughs> so not only are they, you know, colorful and so that's warning you to stay away, but they're also really big. So just take those warning signs and just leave them alone. But they are really fun to, to find because those colors are just like mind blowing. The picture doesn't really do it justice. They are really, really cool. <clears throat> and then this is another one of a really, really cool, unique Kansas bug. So unique, in, in fact, that it is only found in one spring in Scott State Park. So they are very, very small. That is someone holding one on the tip of their finger. <laughs> so it's really hard to find these guys. And they just kind of cling to rocks and eat algae. Um, when in their uh, larval stage, they live in the water for about two to three years. So it takes them a really long time to reach maturity. And they are considered threatened in Kansas and are actually up for um, a federal listing as well. So you know, people are keeping an eye on these, specifically Kansas Department of Wildlife Parks and Tourism is doing a lot of research on these guys and making sure that, you know, we're monitoring populations and trying not to lose these very, very unique little beetles. And this is definitely something that I really, really want to see um, just because, you know, they are so unique to Kansas and it would just be awesome to see these guys in person. Um, the firefly. While it might seem like a pretty normal bug, um, they're actually really, really cool. So most people are familiar with the adult stage shown here. You can catch them, put them on your finger, and they light up and fly away in the summer. And they're one of my absolute favorite things of summer, honestly. And um, they actually have really unique life cycles as well. So the babies look like this little guy. They look like little armored tanks and um, they are actually venomous when they are in their larval stage. And I have, I have found the larval stage once and it wasn't actually me. It was a kid that I was with when we were out looking for bugs. They flipped a log and they found one of these and they're like, oh, what is it? And I was like, ooh, don't touch it because it's venomous. And I don't really know that it would hurt people probably wouldn't. Um, these guys actually eat slugs. So their venom, when they when they bite onto a slug or a snail, um, it actually uh, completely incapacitates that slug and makes it so it can't move at all. Then they eat the slug alive. So it's pretty metal, <laughs> but they are just awesome little guys. And when they do become adults, um, something really, really cool about their flashing patterns is that each species, because there are multiple species, even in Kansas, um, each species has its own unique flash pattern. Um, we have uh, the pyralis species, the one that makes the little J shape. So what they do is they start, they turn on their light and then they turn it off and they float back down, they turn it on and they fly back up so they make a little j shape as they're flying and um so it's very very distinct a lot some will also just do like one flash or two flashes or the ghost light species that we don't have in kansas unfortunately i would love to see these in person um they actually have a blue flash and it's really wavy so also very very unique and there's even some species of fireflies that don't really flash at all. So um, in California, and this is changing a little bit um, as you know temperatures change and things like that, but uh, a lot of West Coast states don't have fireflies that flash. So if you take someone from the West Coast and throw them over on the East Coast or even here in Kansas, they might be really surprised that you have a bunch of bugs flying around, flashing around at night. So super, super cool insects that we kind of take for granted sometimes. But I just love these guys so much. And the red velvet ant. Another insect that you probably don't want to handle. <laughs> Sorry, there's so many on this, but um, they're just very, very unique. 
and they're eye-catching. So I do see a lot of people asking what they are. And I've, I have found multiples of these in Chisholm Creek Park and kind of all over Kansas. They're actually pretty common. They're pretty small, uh, maybe half an inch. Um, but they also have a rather bad reputa reputation. So they're known as the cow killer. And while they can't kill cows, they do have a very, very, very painful sting. And their name is kind of a misnomer. And they are not actually an ant. They are actually a type of wingless wasp. So this picture here is a female and they are completely wingless, but they are really, really fast. So they just scurry along the ground like an ant. And the males do have wings so they can, so that helps them find the females when they're on the ground running around. Um, and their stinger is about half as long as their abdomen. And it's been found that the only reason for it is to just hurt as much as possible. <laughs> so um, a lot of times when an, an animal has pincers or a stinger, it's so that they can stun their prey. But these guys, they just wanna hurt you as much as possible so that you leave them alone. So again, while you can handle them theoretically, um, I would not risk it, just stay safe. And they can stridulate as well, which is just a fancy word for vibrations that make a noise. So if you ever bother one of these guys before they even sting you, they're gonna start making a little and a buzzing noise. And that's just saying, hey, leave me alone, or I'm going to sting you, which is also what their warning colors here are doing. So again, listen to what they're telling you and just leave them alone. That's the best thing to do. <clears throat> the Luna Moth is a very, very common favorite of a lot of different people, and they are in Kansas from about May to June. And those really long tails on these guys, as well as some of our swallowtail butterflies that we have, are actually there to help them evade predators. So um, those tails are kind of distracting and eye-catching, and studies have found that if um, a moth or a butterfly loses its tails on its wings, um, it has a very low survival rate. I think it was about 30% um, versus with moths with tails, it's closer to about 80% of a chance that they are going to evade, say, a bird coming after them. So they really need those tails intact, but it's also kind of nice if a bird comes after you and they just take your tails, then they can keep flying just fine without those little tails on their wings. Um, but yeah, they're really, really cool. And the, the edges of their wings on this one, it's kind of purple, but they can also be more brownish. So it just kind of depends on the time of year that they, that they emerge from their cocoons. In the fall, I believe they're a little bit more purple. Um, nobody really knows why that is, but just kind of a fun fact. And this next one is one again that we probably shouldn't handle. Um, and it's probably one that you've seen either, you know, like in a wood pile or maybe even in your house or your work. And I think it's really important to be able to identify these guys. So this is the brown recluse spider. They are venomous and they are one of the two spider species in Kansas that are considered venomous to humans. So that means that they, um, you know, are dangerous to humans should you get bit. Um, so they are, this is a female on the bottom and a male on the top. So the females um, often have a very large abdomen and it just gets bigger if she has eggs. Um, and then the males have a much smaller abdomen, very, very spindly legs, um, very skinny legs. And they have a little fiddle or a violin on their back. Um, there are also other spiders like cellar spiders that have a very similar marking on their back, but no other spider has those like really, really long legs and the pale body um, and the darker abdomen, especially on the males. So they are pretty unique. You can see what the male compared to the quarter. So they are, you know, a decent sized spider, but if you see a really, really big spider, like in your basement, it's probably a wolf spider. It's not one of these guys. So that's as big as they get. They don't get super, super big. And um, they do, not that you should get close enough to find this out, um, but they do only have six eyes. So they are the, this family of spiders is the only family that has six eyes. So they are unique in that aspect, but probably don't get close enough to count their eyes. And again, they have that violin on their back, which is pretty distinctive. Um, their venom, um, a lot of times when people get bit by these guys, 
they don't even know. Um, but sometimes it can lead up to, you know, eating away of tissue or that skin necrosis that we talked about earlier with the redheaded centipede. So you just want to be careful if you do get bit by one of these and keep an eye on that spot and go to the doctor if you start, you know, getting sick. <laughs> And this is the other spider here in Kansas that we kind of have to worry about. Um, this is the black widow spider. Um, on top, they are just shiny, shiny black. Um, and they have the red hourglass on the belly if they are female. The males, on the other hand, um, the picture on the right is a female with her egg case and a male. The males look much, much different. Um, they tend to be pretty colorful. And again, those really long spindly legs and they're much smaller than the females. Um, and it is considered that only the females are venomous because, or it's considered venomous to humans because they're the only ones with fangs um, large enough to pierce your skin. Um, the males are harmless to humans um, and the babies are harmless to humans as well just because they can't get through your skin. Um, but they are really, really quite beautiful spiders, honestly. Um, we had one here at the Nature Center for a while, um, but yeah, we got rid of her because she started laying too many egg sacs. <laughs> Um, and their venom can cause anywhere from mild muscle aches to nausea. Um, it's very rare that people need to be um, hospitalized from a black widow bite, but again, you just want to make sure that you're staying safe and go to the hospital if needed. Um, and again, it's rarely fatal. So thank you guys for listening. I am going to stop my screen share and um, I want to show you guys some insects that I have. So I took these from the Great Plains Nature Center so I could show you here at my house. Um, and these are just common Wichita butterflies. So if you have a really nice pollinator garden, um, these are some insects and butterflies in particular that you could be attracting. Um, so something to keep in mind if you want to attract a specific kind of butterfly, like say maybe monarch butterflies, like these two here, um, you have to plant their host plant or what their babies, their larvae are feeding on. Um, so if you don't have milkweed in your garden, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of uh, monarch butterflies visiting it because they don't have anything for their babies to eat. Um, things like uh, tiny little skippers. So um, we have a lot of skippers in Kansas, um, and they actually eat things like um, grasses. Um, some of these butterflies over here are actually using trees as their host plants. So there's lots of different plants that you could be using to attract these guys. Um, but I just really love all of these butterflies. They're so beautiful. Um, here's some swallowtails I was talking about earlier. They have those beautiful tails. Um, they have those tails like the Luna Moth does. Um, and again, it helps them evade predators. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for listening. And I hope you stay safe out there. And have a lovely day. Thanks. Mm-hmm.